Hello, everyone. I would like to acknowledge and pay respects to the Wurundjeri people as traditional custodians of the land that I'm on today, which is our office at 273 High Street, Preston, and I pay my respects to the elders past and present. I also acknowledge that we are all on Aboriginal land across Australia. Sovereignty was never ceded, uh, always was and always will be Aboriginal land. I'm Narita Waite. I'm a proud Yorta Yorta Narindjeri woman with Tanarong connections and lucky enough to be the CEO of the Victorian Aboriginal Legal Service. Working for VALS has been a journey that has allowed me to experience so many sides of the criminal justice and child protection systems, where sadly the impacts of invasion and colonist ideologies still pervade. We see the legacy of racism and violence, which causes harm to our clients, Aboriginal people, their families, and their communities each and every day. As VALS marks its 50 year anniversary as one of Australia's oldest community legal services this year, we look back on our fight for justice, our fight to put a stop to systemic racism, and our fight to end Aboriginal deaths in custody. This has been an ongoing struggle for our people since the day the British colonisers invaded our lands. Our culture survived despite the harmful injustices that have been inflicted on us for 234 years and given us strength to continue the struggle for justice. We know that through connection to culture, community and country, we can pave the way to a brighter and more just future for our people. Today's amazing panel will share their wisdom and expertise with us throughout this process. First up, I'll welcome Sissy Austin. Sissy, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, my name's Sissy Austin. I'm a Gunnichamara Kirai Warong Japarong woman. Woke up on Wadarong country, uh, but work down here on Wurundjeri country. And yeah, I work in politics and First Nations women's health and yeah, community organizer. Thank you, Sissy. We also have on our panel today Tyson Lovett Murray. Welcome, Tyson. Would you like to introduce yourself? Thanks, Narita. Yeah, my name is Tyson Lovett Murray. Um, I'm a Greenwich Murray boy from Southwest Victoria. Currently a park ranger. Worked in other roles. Formerly worked at the legal service and um, Daly Munro in Melbourne as well. Thank you, Tyson. Unfortunately, Val's Tani and Onus Williams wasn't able to join us today, but luckily for us, we're joined by Naoko Gori. Nayoka, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Nayoka. I'm a Gunai Kurnai Gunachamara Wiradjuri Yorta Yorta person. Um, I'm here on Wiradjuri country. Yeah, I'm a, an essayist and screenwriter and also a committee member of the Incarcerated Trans and Gender Diverse Fund, which is a mutual aid project providing funds to trans and gender diverse people who are locked up or criminalised. Thank you. Lastly, just a content warning. We will be discussing issues that will potentially include references to Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander people who, have, who are deceased, um, who issues of self-harm, trauma, violence, abuse and racism. If any part of our discussion raises issues or concerns for you, we encourage Aboriginal and Islander people to call Yarning Safe and Strong, which is a helpline run by VARS on 1800 959 563 and anyone can call Lifeline on 13 11 14. We are pushing the Victorian government to raise the age of criminal responsibility to at least 14. Um, this has been a long and arduous fight. Many of our children and young people are funneled through the child protection system and residential care before, they're in, before they are incarcerated. Why is the child protection system failing our children so badly and how can we stop the harm it is doing to our communities? Yeah, it's a massive question and I guess, you know, my input into it is only, you know, minor within within the whole community and the stories and experiences and, you know, solutions that our communities have. But why is the child protection failing our system, our children and feeding, you know, into the justice system? It's a heartbreaking reality that, you know, Aboriginal kids, our kids are having to experience a system that was built to destroy us as a people. And, you know, you hear there is on the other side talk about it being, you know, a system that protects children from harm and um, removes children from unsafe, you know, situations. And, you know, there's no safer place than, you know, Koori kids being with us, with community, you know, surrounded by elders, aunties, uncles, and it's, 
yeah, it's kind of a thing that I've been on as a kinship carer and I completely, you know, honour the stories and the journeys of the young people that I've cared for over the years. I've cared for quite a few family members over the years and every single Koori child has a story of their own, but something that stands out, you know, is the isolation and the disconnection from siblings, from parents, from community. And there's only so much that deadly carers can do to heal the hurting hearts of our young ones who just want to be, you know, with mum, with dad. Yeah, it's, it's broken hearts. And it's a system that's failing our kids in every single element of their lives. And carers, Koori carers are just trying to keep up with that, you know. So, yeah, I guess there's not like one single answer to it other than if you look back at the history of how the system was built, like particularly child protection down here in Victoria and the intentions of why it was built and who it was built for, you've really got to get back to those initial elements of the child protection system to understand why it's failing our young ones and you know, out of frustration, I did write that piece around the child protection system. And I got quite obsessed with, you know, investigating it and doing all this reading. And I was trying to understand why I was so angry and so frustrated at the system whilst caring for my family members and just having child protection in my house nearly every day and like having to deal with just all the stuff, the daily stuff. And my kind of coping mechanism was doing all this research to understand, you know, where it originates, why it originated. And and you really, once you do understand that, then you see how it still haunts, you know, haunts our kids and is controlling our kids. Just in response to what you said, I just wondered if you could elaborate on you talked about um, how you know you, you did that reflection and that work on looking at the history and the operations of the system and there's a lot of talk always about self-determination and the child protection system but for you with your experiences and with the knowledge that you've gained is that a pathway to a solution and how would they actually move towards that if at all? There's absolutely no real authentic self-determination within the child protection system. And I speak from a place of experience and seeing it play out and particularly, and I know my sister won't mind yarning about it, but you realise the lack of self-determination in our mothers fighting for our babies and our mothers self-determining their children's lives when you know you're standing out the front of child protection with a mother laying on the ground in tears like when you go to a court hearing and you know the court determines the life of each individual young person and as much as our we've got amazing workers in community doing as much as you know they can and we can to make the daily struggle that tiny bit you know easier with having black fellas working in the space and that's just like there's no self-determination in that when you're already being controlled through this system through child protection and then they're being court orders that say specifically what you can and can't do with that child so where those orders are already made it's those orders are already made and then there's a referral potentially to like section 18 which is something that's being rolled out across our state but my criticism of section 18 is that the decisions have already been made in the courts in the child protection system who you know mates with the courts in a really intimidating and actually scary violent way so I absolutely acknowledge the work that our people are doing on the ground like in trying to make this work so it doesn't add as much trauma but yeah I 
I couldn't give you an example of where there has been self-determination. I feel like, you know, as a kinship carer, about the only thing you can decide over the young person, the family member that you're caring for is, you know, what they're going to eat. <laughs> and that's like what it literally came down to, you know, it's, it's, you know, you have to fight for what school you want them to go to. We want them to go to the school with all the Koori kids. It's like, well, why? Like they've got to go, you know, to this one or that one. And then it's, it, it's a multitude of things and it's just incredibly frustrating. And I <laughs> shout out to any kinship carers that are watching this because I know the struggle and I'm here. And whilst I'm not a kinship carer anymore for the first time in my entire twenties, I, I do want to not let the pain and hurt that I've seen and witnessed and experienced go by the wayside because our kids yeah, need us to keep on fighting whilst they're silenced by the system. Yeah, it's funny because I was, yeah, a kinship carer for over a year um, and I'd message Sissy to be like, these C words. Um, <laughs> yes, so thank you for your solidarity during that time, Sissy. Um, I think there's two parts to the question. Uh, the first was around the age of criminal responsibility and then the next part was around uh, the role of uh child theft, uh, funneling our kids into that system. I think the with the age of criminal responsibility stuff, I think like as an abolitionist, I really struggle with the conversation because 14 feels like, 14 feels like a compromise. And I like, I, I understand the logic of it from a campaigning perspective, but I think we should personally, I think we should be pushing. We get more when we demand more, which is something Dean Spade, a trans lawyer, yeah, a quote of his. So, yeah, I, I do worry that by pushing, I think we can demand for more, but I understand the, yeah, for people kind of jaded by the system, 14 feels like a compromise they can live with, but 15 and 16 and 17, uh, uh, yeah, I think no kid should be locked up. Yeah, I mean, I don't think anyone should be locked up. I think prison shouldn't exist. Anyway, so that's, yeah, the criminal responsibility stuff, but thinking particularly about how the logics that inform um, child safety are related to, are very, they're very carceral logics. So I think that it's a system, like it's a continuation of genocide if we think about like not being able to, you know, wipe us all out and then trying to assimilate us. It's, yeah, like Sissy said, this is just, this is just a, another part of that. I think it's also, so it's, yeah, there's, there's, I think this really big, there's a strong relationship between colonialism and genocide and also carceral and like racist logics informing it. I think it's not necessarily broken. I think it's really, I think the system is doing what it's designed to do. It punishes black mothers. Um, it's constantly like, Sissy, you know, like, the, the goalpost is constantly shifting and, and like our, it's like these impossible demands that are just made up by people who have no relationship to the kids. Your workers are constantly changing. It's yeah, it is. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a stupid system, but it feels like it is designed to punish black women. And also something i found as a carer really interesting was how the state tries to make you as the kinship carer part of their surveillance and part of their machinery and if you're not yeah if you're not thinking about it um, it really tries to pit you against the parent so it's this like paternalism that's also at play as well I think if you're not yeah they really they try to get you on side and try to get information out of you. But all the while, you know that they're taking notes and no matter what, they're building a case. Yeah. So I think like, yes, um, obviously like cops suck and like screws suck, but also thinking about the role of the social worker in all of this as well. I think a book that really helped me think about particularly the, the system of ch like child safety, so-called child safety, child theft, was Shattered Bonds by Dorothy Roberts, who's a black scholar from America. 
she also had a, another really cool book called um, Killing the Black Body. But she, in Shattered Bond, she talks about how it's a system, at least in America, designed to punish black mothers. And I think it definitely applies here. Yasin, do you have any reflections to add to that discussion so far? Unlike these two people, uh, Sissy and Nayuka, I'm not a, I've never been a kinship carer, but I did have a conversation with an aunt uh, recently about um, her experiences as a carer. And to speak to, um, I suppose, what Nayuka was saying about the, um, you know, the surveillance from the state for them to build cases and things like that, like they did share that they, um, you know, part of their experience, they don't believe in permanent care as black fellows. They, they believe in keeping kids with community and with family and connecting with country and things like that. And they, they their experience was that they were almost like sort of the, the department had tried to force them to do permanent care, which it was really sort of frustrating for them. And then also, like the other thing that they mentioned was that um, that there's there's still barriers in the way of sort of taking kids to return to country trips and things like that. Like there's not enough resources. A lot of the trips that this person had done for the, the kids that they were caring for, they did off their own back. And or, or if they got resources, they had to jump through too many hoops um, and things like that. And it gets really frustrating and and things like that. They also mentioned like they sort of feel after they take on kids, they feel out of sight, out of mind with the department as well. But yeah, other than that, like they've had, yeah, they they just, they feel like they sort of need more resources to do do more with the kids. You know, like as Sissy mentioned, you know, the impacts of colonisation and like our communities are still clawing our ways out of poverty and things like that. And then you'll get community members who put their hand up who are in a position to take on these kids and do the best they can. You know, they certainly need need more resources um, from what I heard to, to keep these kids um, connected and, and back with family, which is a, a deeply a cultural principle for our communities. And, you know, if there's anything they can do to remove those barriers, the better, I guess. But I suppose like Sissy and I across this stuff a lot more than what I am. I might just also jump in there. Um, something I forgot to talk about was the relationship between child safety and criminalisation. So when kids do, when kids behave like kids, particularly if they're like stolen from their families, sort of normal kid behaviour or responses to this violence from the state becomes criminalised. So, you know, warrants will be put out if they do abscond or, if you know, if they take off or that sort of thing. And then also for kids, so like Sissy and I are speaking to the kinship care experience, but also our kids in resi care are at mm-hmm. such risk of being criminalised if they do, you know, very not, you know, normal kid stuff that if you did it in the home would just be dealt with in the family. So, you know, someone... Well, firstly, they lock up food. Anyway, that's weird. Mm. But once again, carceral logics informing the way our kids are cared for. But say someone puts a hole in the wall, which, you know, happens in, you know, kids are kids or whatever, then suddenly the, de- the department is goes to the police to get that on file so that they can take that to the insurance. So it becomes a criminal matter. And our kids, and like this, this also has a long history when we got our grandmother, my great grandmother's records back from when she was stolen, every time she took off from the home that she was at over at Parkville, which is now a kid's prison, she would, she would get picked like a warrant basically would go out and there's like, we have records of her absconding. I just find that, yeah, that sort of ongoing continuation stuff really interesting, but there is a very, I guess what I'm saying is, so while they're all like these systems are informed by the same logics, there's also a very clear, like very, very clear, I guess, criminalising like sequence of events that the department put our kids through. Yeah. All right. I'm- I think we, I mean, the, the obvious one that we always use is, you know, the hole in the wall, but here at Bowers, we've seen children criminalised for spilt milk and the removal of food. Um, and that really puts children on that criminalisation pathway and they start to move up the sentencing hierarchy really quite quickly. And then we're suddenly talking about, you know, periods on remand, um, periods on sentence. Um, and then, you know, that ultimate pathway uh, often, unfortunately, is to adult prisons. And that's why we've seen the prison rate has most doubled over the last 10 years in Victoria alone, um, those sort of jurisdictions. Uh, and, you know, where initiatives are put in place to decriminalise children, like the decriminalisation framework in residential care, 
those frameworks aren't applied and there's no oversight of those frameworks there's no reporting on those frameworks all the things that they say they put in place to try and reduce these instances they're not meaningfully implemented it, it's purely symbolic and that goes back to the history you talk about that we unfortunately confront each and every day and Talking about long-standing issues, uh, last week the Victorian government announced it would decriminalise public intoxication following years of powerful and relentless advocacy by Yorta Woman Kenya Day's family after her death in custody in 2017. The government also announced there would be returning prison health care Victorians with women's prisons to public health care providers um, thanks to the advocacy of Ronnie Penelson's loved ones after her death in custody in 2020. Why do you think these campaigns in particular um, resulted in changes to the legal, to, to the legal system and um, even to the way that uh, public and the sectors involved approach these issues? I guess as a writer, I'm interested in the way that these things are communicated. I think um, I was particularly in awe of Aunty Tanya Day's family. I think that coronial inquest itself was, I think when we examine things in the future and have a bit of um, time to think about it. I think we'll see the way that they mobilised and filled out that coroner's court and their, like, their relentless, uncompromising nature. I think, yeah, I think that, I think that's played a huge role. They stuck, they knew what they wanted. They stuck to it the whole time. And someone interested in communication, that, they just, they were so impressive in the face of the like colonial and death admin that they were forced to go through. I think that this kind of mass coordination for, for both of those campaigns, it's also, I think, cynically, I think governments like easy wins. So yeah, wins, wins that will make them look good or that won't cost them an election. I think, yeah, I think that that also plays a role. And also, I think in particularly in coronial processes, not, I'm obviously not an expert, you would know so much more, but I think it's um, the internal side of things from the departments or the governments are looking for, they're looking, I think often looking for someone or something to pin the failure on when it is often a it is a systemic failure yeah those are my initial thoughts but sissy and um tyson you might have others yeah look i'm i'm not you know a major expert on it but as a community member i just i think that tanya days the days family has done you know incredible throughout the fire and whilst grieving for their mother and you know, we as community could see that and we could feel that. And I think that, you know, we could feel that they were fighting for, you know, justice for Tanya Day, but they were also fighting for us. It was a fight to, you know, ensure that it doesn't happen again or, like, attempt to ensure that it doesn't happen again, like, around those specific circumstances. And... Yeah, when I reflect back on the time of the campaign, like, you know, like April getting up at every single rally, like people had, you know, the clipboards, like signing, like there was massive on every, you know, element of the campaign. It was just so strategically organised and like all bases covered and it was like, I don't know, I think it was just like this tidal wave that was like powered by the strength of the Day family and the love for their mum and, you know, and like our love for black women in particular. Yeah, alongside that, you know, the, the fight for Jackarung country was happening at the exact same time and it kind of had, you know, this linkage with the violence on us and particularly it being you know women's country and then you know Arnie, Arnie Tanya Day and that fight and I just always felt so appreciative and so much love for April in you know being at the Jackarung rally and then you know then we marched the rally down to 
the court where, you know, the mob who were fighting for Jaffron country were then packing out um, the court throughout the coronial inquest. And I don't know, I just think that's the power of our people. And yeah, I just massive congratulations to the win. It just breaks my heart that the circumstances that needed to occur for the government of the day to act. And yeah, that's kind of like my little bit into it. Just, you know, love and respect for the day family. And um, like, you know, thanks to them for, you know, for what they've done for our community and for the country as well. Thank you for those reflections. And in both of those inquests, the issue of systemic racism was raised. And I just wondered, you know, from our panelists, you know, what examples of systemic racism do you see most in your day to day and what can be done to dismantle that? I'd like to acknowledge the Day family too in that campaign. Um, I was I didn't have any sort of proximity to the campaign, but to just see it play out was um, pretty incredible and yeah, a lot of strength and courage that they have. Um, but I guess in regards to um, systemic um, racism, um, down there, so I'm from Southwest Victoria. It's everywhere, I guess it feels, as a Gunnishmara person or Gunnishmara country. You know, we uh, we did sort of, our, the local council had a, um, just this exhibition of the Henty family, one of the, um, the invaders or colonizers yeah. that first come to the southwest of Victoria. You know, there's signs up down home. They refer to the southwest as the birthplace of Victoria because they settled there or invaded there before the oh, Batman got to Melbourne or whatever. But like, our small community um, just got together and just expressed our concerns about the, the way they'll glorify and these uh, colonizers and you know they they don't there's there's not much uh, truth telling that comes from you know the settlers when it comes to history and all that sort of stuff you know the entities weren't good people and all this sort of stuff and could go all day but you know you see that sort of stuff around town there's also you know there's the, the long history of colonization you know our community we have been getting land handed back since we got off the mission and kicked off the mission in the 50s. And, you know, it started with the fight of Aunty Sandra, Onis and Aunty Tina Saunders um, with our COA in the early 1980s. And then I think 84, the mission was handed back and some other parcels of land um, through the 90s, more land was handed back. Our community applied for native title in 96 and got it in 2007, which in itself was problematic. But like, it's been a long journey. Um, but... I suppose in regards to systemic uh, racism, you know, you, you just see this extraction culture from, you know, settler society. You know, one of my key projects at the moment is to do uh, a monitoring program for short fin deals and, and fish biodiversity in Gunnishmara waterways, uh, one specific one. But, you know, we're working with the state and, you know, there's, there's agencies in the state that are, you know, they, they're underfunded. They're happy to see more research done and, um, but in regards to short fin deals in Victoria, they don't monitor, uh, they only monitor from the catchers um, and things like that. And I suppose this is all in regards to, you know, caring for country and stuff like that. So they don't monitor what's coming into the system. So they're, they're taken from the system and then they're not known if it's sustainable or not. And, you know, which is a, a another deep cultural principle of um, our community um, to do things in a sustainable way. So we're working on that. Once again, thinking about like the communication of stuff and how, I think structural racism is a hard thing for people to understand like the different the different ways that different systems and their the way that they operate internally collude with each other to keep us in our place. I was I've been thinking a lot about how white supremacy and colonialism kind of it just it leaks into and informs every part of our life, really every part of the way that we live, whether it's like paying rent on to like white landlords or, you know, the way that we, and the, yeah, say rent increases, for example, like who, who are the people that are most like stuck with that or yeah, who's experiencing homelessness or sleeping rough and that sort of thing. But yeah, to even the way that like health systems operate and the, the way that black, yeah, black people are killed by those systems slowly or very quickly, um, whether it's pain not being taken seriously or, 
or, you know, people thinking that we want drugs when we are very, very, very sick to the way that our children are taught at school um, and what they're taught and who they're taught by um, and what they're told is the truth in this place. It's, it's hard to, it is hard, I think, to, for people to fully comprehend just how massive the colonial project is. I mean, coronial inquests are actually a good example of, um, uh, well, Ani Tanya's actually, yeah, her coronial um, inquest, I think was a really clear example of the different ways that systems can collude with each other from, you know, transport to police to healthcare. Yeah, the, this place is in collusion, basically to kill us slowly or quickly. Sissy, do you have anything to add on that? Yeah, I think it can it can get quite, you know, overwhelming when you when you're trying to comprehend that colonial project that you know, was yarning about and yeah, I was just reflecting on you know some things with like it can be things like the you know, the black like our netball players who are on like these, you know, white country teams, the benching of our players who are like, you know, the deadliest players on the team, like it's that, like, and that can go across all sports, you know. Um, I'm not going to talk like a sports person because <laughs> I'm not so much. But and then, you know, going back to the topic around the child protection system, often what I've seen is where there is a white dad involved in in the situation where, you know, child protection slash the court slash, you know, so social workers and all those who are part like the, the, the like the white parent involved always being favoured and treating so, treated so differently throughout the process of like, having child protection in your life. And you can really see that when you compare and contrast the orders that are placed on like a black mother in comparison to, you know, a white father. I think like the police response to violence experienced by Aboriginal women in particular, and I'm just, you know, speaking of women as a, as a woman and, you know, um, seeing that play out, like it's hard to pinpoint where there's no like specific comments but it's 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 not taking the violence seriously it's not taking you know the injury as like a serious injury it's not like it's like it's assuming that it's like the the aboriginal mother's fault the way that you see it play out and then like with regards to like kinship care it's where you see the the difference between the treatment and the support with, you know, kinship carers, births, like white foster carers and, you know, what they can offer, like this big deadly flash house in somewhere and, like, that is what, you know, is better for, you know, that child and those different, you can, the thing with the way that I've seen it play out is that I've cared for siblings across a sibling group who are separated across multiple carers where there's, you know, black carers and then there's white carers of the same sibling group and the way that you see that play out that's racism and but it's not you know called that and there have I've been in situations where even the white carers are getting wild because they're like you know we've gotten this 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 and this like why is it so hard for you to get a three-year-old a bed like we've we've had 12 months rent paid for you know and you can't get a bed it's like it's those things. Um, and then the final thing, like, I oh know two more things is like the cultural plans that you see Koori kids in care get. And like, it's this folder that heartbreakingly you see travel with that child in the placements that they're placed in. And do you know what I love about Koori kids, like who have grown up in community, they know who they are. They know who their families are. Like, and um, there was this moment where this 
deadly, you know, flash looking really probably expensive printed cultural plan that had like literal Wikipedia printouts of like, you know, this is Gunditjmara country and then like this is your family tree and like a child that I was caring for being like, my, like my auntie, like my dad isn't my auntie's, you know, they're not brother and sister, like what are they talking about? But then when I think about the other siblings in that sibling group of the younger siblings who have that cultural plan, like who haven't yet grown up, you know, with community because they're so young being placed straight with white carers, there's that compare and contrast of like the passing on of cultural knowledge that's correct <laughs> and that's not just um, whipped off Wikime Wikimedia. <laughs> Wikipedia and placed in that cultural plan um and the final thing like a couple of years ago like it can be broken down to things such as going to a pharmacy like especially in like a country town where like say you're on antidepressants and a comment from like a pharmacist being like why is it that so many aborigines are on antidepressants like <laughs> that's a comment that I experienced a couple of years ago and it was just like it was just like this baffled moment where she was just like just couldn't understand it so like it's those moments that are jarring in our paths of our day-to-day -day lives you know like it's like I just want to be able to you know go there without having your stupid ass questioning of why Aborigines are on you know um whatever that's like my two cents into it but you could totally talk so deeply into the experiences of our kids and like their experiences in white foster care placements like um and I completely acknowledge that and just want to you know mention that and make sure that that's you know that's on it and that's always at the forefront of my mind is like our darling babies who are in you know white foster care placements in um all of your answers um there were there was mention of colonization and there's often a lot of talk about what reversing colonization means so i'm wondering if anybody's wanting to talk about what reversing colonization means to them i guess like thinking about colonization i suppose you always well we get given and taught this picture of sort of our and how our communities lived in abundance and, and thrived pre-colonisation. And it's trying to get back to that thriving and, and, and abundance again. And, you know, we've spoken to the impacts of colonisation and, and, and things like that. And for me, it, it's what I love is being out on country unbothered by settlers or being out there with mob um, on country, just doing whatever we're doing, um, which means, you know, having access to country and, and things like that. So, yeah, a big part of it is, is getting land back and, and looking after country and being involved in a lot of the, the decision making about country. So, obviously, you've got different state agencies that, um, you know, have national parks and, and reserves and, and crown land and stuff like that that you have to deal with. But, yeah, it's about just being able to get back out on country and, and, um, and spend time out there with mob and, you know, stopping this narrative from the settlers and the colonisers uh, colonizers about, you know, Aboriginal people, you know, whether you're talking about, you know, the, the myths around, um, you know, us just being hunter-gatherer societies and, you know, we were farmers and we, we, you know, we do have ingenuity and we do engineer landscapes, things like that, you know, like part of my work was being part of the World Heritage Listing for the Buzzwing Cultural Landscape based on, well, it's framed as the world's oldest and largest um, aquaculture at 6,600 years old. Um, and that was restored by our community um, in 2010 when we put a weir on a European drain. Um, so our community has reflooded a lot of different wetlands on Gunditjmara country, um, which is great. And then you see that country come to life, all the, the water birds and stuff come back, which is really good. But then I suppose in regards to, you know, these, when you see country like there's, a, I suppose, the saying back home, it's um, not your man, not your mara, which is the healthy country, healthy people. And, you know, um, being able to do that, it, it, it does help our mob. Like one of the best programs we've had um, for my community back home is the Care for Country program, which has employed a, a mob of our mob doing um, work on country. And, um, you know, the, the government, they wrote a report about the, the, 
the, the co-benefits of, of the program socially for our mob. And, um, you know, they can write their reports, but I can say with my own eyes, you know, anecdotally, I've, I've seen, you know, the, the positive impacts that's had on my community, myself, my, my family members um, and other family groups down home, which is really good. So, yeah, in regards to reverse and um, colonisation, you know, we're trying to uplift our communities um, from these impacts of colonisation, um, you know, the health impacts, things like that, um, and having access to land. And, you know, there's uh, one example is the solar settlement scheme that happened in the, the, you know, the 30s and the 50s, where they gave land to non-Aboriginal returned soldiers and none of our, none of our mob that served in the wars and stuff like that. Um, you know, I went to school with the great grandkids of one of the persons that land given to them, it was the mission land. Um, and they sold it for a million dollars just the other day. So our mobs were locked out of that, you know, economic development opportunity, all that stuff. But um, yeah, key point being, yeah, getting back out on country and having access to country. Um, yeah. Thanks. Following on from that, Tyson, since uh, we've got you, uh, what would you what would you like to see in the future of Aboriginal land preservation and environmental management in Victoria in terms of, you know, uh, contributing to the non-glorification of colonisation? Uh, I suppose, you know, I'm, I, I will say it each time, you know, just more land back in control of our community's hands. And, yeah, restoring country, you know, there's there's big issues around, you know, extension of, of you know, culturally significant species, like all the species that, you know, we'll, we'll deal with an agency and they'll say which, which species are culturally significant, but they all are. We've, our communities have always had holistic views of country and things like that. So, and, you know, restoring our waterways, um, you know, working, I suppose, you know, towards, you know, you got climate change, which was a big issue. Um, so restoring our waterways and um, some of these um, areas along those those waterways, which look after, um, you know, a big mob of um, biodiversity and things like that. Putting more sort of cultural fire back in the country as well. So we're building up our cultural burning program. You know, these, these cool burns are really good for country. We've been using them to help sort of restore biodiversity, but um, look after country as well. Um, you know, we've been using it for a threatened species like the Australasian uh, bitten, um, the red-tailed black cockatoo as well. Um, you know, trying to restore their, their food um, habitats for those uh, red tails. So, yeah, that's what it sort of looks like for me. It's over 30 years since the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody and the recommendations from that commission were never fully implemented. We've seen similar issues repeated in Royal Commissions like the one that investigated Dondale and the NT, a youth prison that's still open despite the commission recommending it be closed. Why don't governments take these commissions seriously and why haven't Australians held them to account for their inaction? Oh, yeah, thank you, Tyson. Just want to acknowledge... Um, yeah, as a Gunajamara fella living on Gunajamara land. Yeah, I really love hearing about all the deadly work you're doing. Publicly acknowledge that, I guess. With regards to your question, I think the government, through its various different processes, likes to have um, the illusion of action. And so it forces us to participate in inquests and investigations and jump through all these different hoops which I think for the most part, but I think, yeah, I think um, a lot of that is about, I think those processes are perceived to be objective is one, is like, is one part. And so if we're, they're objective because they're made by white people, um, they're very colonial and we're forced to participate. They're never forced to participate on our terms that we're, they're not ever participating in our, uh, our modes of accountability. It is us sitting in their courtrooms or us sitting in their consultations, et cetera. So, I, yeah, I think a lot of it is it honestly buys time in a lot of these cases. I think it can, we know, we've always known what the solutions are. We've always, and we don't need to sit through months and months or years of fact-finding missions to, to know that. We also see how these, um, these particular processes can be, we know that when the government want to act quickly, they can do so. I'm thinking about the Northern Territory intervention. They had some poxy report and then, you know, and then fabricated staffers on ABC programs or fabricated characters pretending to be community workers who turned out to be staffers. 
Um, and then next minute, we've got tanks rolling into communities. So we know that the government can act quickly when they want to, when it's in their interest to. But these other processes that, that I think it's about, it's honestly just us working on their timelines and us, like for them to have the appearance of appearance of objectivity um, when we don't need to sit through those processes to tell them what we, we know, we already have all the answers and we always have. And in terms of the why, I think it's, you know, like colonialism and white supremacy is I think what it comes down to. And this idea that we're a doomed people that we don't know how to manage our own affairs. Yeah, they'll, they'll throw excuses out, um, but ultimately, they don't know how to listen to black fellas because they don't want to, because it's not in their interest to. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I think part of the frustrating part is that we at the moment in this state are talking voice, treaty and truth. Yet there's, I think, a limited discussion around transforming or creating our own justice system. It's about how do we mitigate the current one and how do we continue, um, how do we adapt coroner's courts to investigate Aboriginal deaths? I was going to say, I think that really relates to your question around the, like, reversing colonialism stuff. I think, yeah, I think we're often in this mitigation and, like, survival state because we're forced to be in that state. Um, but I do wonder, yeah, like, what are the what are the logics and principles of value and values of colonialism that leak into every single part of our lives. And I think these processes are a really good example. Why are we always being forced to meet, to meet on their terms? Yeah, anyway, sorry. Got a lot to say today. <laughs> no, it's always good to have a lot to say. Um, and it's nice not to be the one doing all the talking, <laughs> as can be the case. Prisons and police contact are harmful to everyone, and that should not be an uncontroversial. Uh, sorry, that should not be a controversial statement. But they can be particularly harmful for Aboriginal people because it means we lose our connections to country, culture, kin. Um, why are those connections so important, and what's the impact of having them cut off by being taken into custody? So each time an Aboriginal child, woman man is taken into custody remanded often for petty offending what is that what is the impact of that on them and what does it mean for their trajectory in life um i'll oh, sorry i'll just very quickly jump back in i'm haven't been locked up um before so i don't want to speak to the experiences of our mob who are inside um yeah. or criminalized um but i do know as a family member with family who've been in and out um, I know the impact on families. Um, it is it is a form of displacement, and I I think if we think about if we think about like zoom out and look at the numbers and the history of prisons and the history of police and the the role of police. Most of our massacres, for example, actually please fact check this someone, but many of our massacres uh, were carried out by police. And I don't think the relationship between genocide and policing has ever changed or ever will. But yeah, I, I haven't been inside, but I know as a family member, they it is heart-wrenching and it is so violent. I think we also, like personally, yeah, there's a, sorry to like recommend all these readings, but there's a really good um, essay called Against Innocence by a writer called Jackie Wang. I'll try and find the link. We often can get caught in this, um, yeah, like what you were saying about the petty theft stuff. I think like, once again, I'm interested in communication. We, it's, we have to, I think we have to be careful about speaking about the nature necessarily of offences because it's actually, it doesn't matter how innocent we are, people don't want black people to live or be free and liberated so and I think prisons play a massive role in that yes and it, prisons at the moment are, are a complete private industry turning over billions and billions of dollars um it's a industrial complex that's for sure <laughs> uh, 
Uh, Sissy, Tyson, anything to add um, to what we've discussed thus far? Yeah, I just think, yeah, I absolutely agree with Nay. Like I wouldn't, you know, speak on the experience of our people locked up, um, but, you know, I've had family members and, um, you know, you asked about the importance of, you know, culture, country, family, I think those, and, you know, it's just, that's our means of survival and where that's cut off, it's, um, yeah, it's unimaginable. And I think like when you connect as well, like the police and child protection and the role that police play in the removal of kids and how um, child protection and the police do that together, like is something and it's like, it's violent and it's, um, you know, racist and it's just effed pretty much. And I think like a, a, something that would be incredible would be like a panel of mob willing to speak on that experience who have been incarcerated. Yeah, I just I agree with Sissy. I think it'd be it's really uh, be really valuable to hear more from mob that have been um, locked up. I will make one comment. Like I've got a, a brother who's just gone back, and I know like the thing that served him while he was in was paint and country and, and things like that. So, but yeah, it's. I mean, a lot of these questions were pretty loaded questions, but yeah, I think it'd be really valuable to hear more from our, our mob that have been um, through that system and had that experience. I think also just like not forgetting, I think when we talk about community, we have like prisons are community too. They, they operate in this way where it's like out of sight, out of mind, and that's on purpose. So the violence that occurs in them is, you know, obscured or whatever but like but yeah so like not forgetting for those of us who are out not forgetting our family and friends and community members who are still inside because they're still a part of our community that's incredibly important when you look at um how often they're in and out um and you know very short and sharp transitions mm. often enough um there's a lot that is done for them without them um and yeah see that um, in the designs of you know, programs and initiatives and also a lot of the positioning and it's not it's not hard um, like you've all said to engage um, with those community members who incarcerated to make that effort um, and frankly um, often enough um, it is the favorite part of my job um, because it's honest um, it's open um, and they're clear and Really, they're probably more expert than I will ever be um, on issues in the justice system. So um, couldn't echo those calls loud enough. I'm preparing to give evidence at the next Uruk thing and I'm digging through at the moment like old emails that I had written, you know, to the department, which has been a process in itself. Um, but something that's really stood out is like, me like emailing 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 the department trying to get permission for um the kid that was in my care to visit their parent who was incarcerated and the processes that care like it's it's it, i i had it was unsuccessful and when you see my string of emails and my concerns and that like you know um and they're like so strict like you're not allowed to write a letter like you're not allowed to give your address because that that um it's just been real hard it's like it's been real hard to read back on and I think of like my 21 year old self writing all of this and like relaying that back to the child in my care like oh look we're allowed to write but we're not allowed to give our address um for a reply because I'll you know get in trouble from child protection and there is that fear like you, you like you don't want to F up because you don't want the kid like your family member to be taken from you and they that that's a re very real fear and like yeah there was just like so many emails of me being like um and them coming back and then being like you know we don't want this child to be visiting this parent in um in a prison and like then like where there's another sibling in the sibling group they're white carers coming into the email chain and saying like look our the child that we're caring for won't won't cope in that 
environment and if they are to go to Avasa to go with her and not allow the parent to spend time with that child without the two white carers there and checking back through like this is real shit like this is the stuff that's going on right now and like yeah and I'm so glad that I've kept it all in a roundabout way in my email so that one day that information can be passed on to that young person like whilst it is like clear it's something that we've yarned about or whatever but so that like like it's kind of a peace of mind for me to show that I did that all all that I could within this colonial project and like how they're working together to disconnect our children and control our children and you know um demonize our mob who you know are locked up and 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 there was a sentence that I wrote in one of my emails like if you're not going to help me with connecting this child to their parent like how do I how like I said I'm struggling with providing support for this grieving child and I was like if you're not going to help me connect them to their parent what are you going to do to help me with them grieving for their parent right now and it was just like it was like it's it's been like in a row and my so that's just my story as a kinship carer like imagine it it just breaks my heart to imagine everyone else who's those types of emails are sitting in their email box and like tucked away because it's such an upsetting and hard experience to go through where you're just banging your head against the wall and you just give up it's like well what am I meant to do here you know I think that's the thing. They weigh you down. These, like, processes exist to wear us down. Like, it's, like, yeah, thinking about the money you need to have to advocate for lawyers and the time you have to take off work and, like, the administrative burden of, like, the the systems that they have designed. It's, like, it, it's, yeah, it's freaking... How much time, if we cal- I think about this, like yeah. if we calculated all the time in our lifetime, how much time we've spent on like colonial admin, it would be years. I was also just one last thing on, I think that our, I'm thinking about mob who come out and what you were saying, um, Narita, about, you know, that, you know, it's just so, it's time is so disjointed because a few months in, a few months out, few months in, few months out, like people can spend their entire adulthoods in this way till they're like finally locked up for a really long time or whatever. But I'm thinking about the ways and um, for any, for our black orgs, thinking about the way that um, we can support black fellas who have been criminalized and removing the administrative burden, supporting people to get, you know, working with children's checks and not yeah, and the way that I guess as community members that we can we have to not buy into their the state's logic that these people are bad or they're our family, they're our yeah. community. Like we have to resist that too. Yeah, and I, I think that's really important because um, when you when you talk to those who have spent, like you said, their whole adult adulthoods in and out. A lot of the time in those periods that they're out, they're told that, you know, because of their criminal record, it's not possible for them to find employment, which is untrue, Um, that it's unlikely for them to find housing because of their background. Again, um, you know, there are opportunities, um, but they're basically told that you're so institutionalised that there isn't a life beyond prison for you, um, that all you can hope for is, is a carceral life. Um, So certainly um, I couldn't echo your calls, um, you know, more and I think it's really important that um, as organizations whilst we're engaging in mitigations we are doing that transformative work like not just how do we cope within the system that we are now faced with but how do we actually exit that um, and look um, to establish our own um, systems that you know are based upon our own culture community kin and beliefs Um, really important um, that we do that dual work now we get to move to the fun question, more questions, um, but these times um, it's questions from other people. So I'm sure they're gonna be amazing. The first one is from Roxanne Moore, which is how do we imagine a world outside of the carceral logic and prison industrial complex? I feel like we are always talking in the bars 
and what is the possibility of this happening through federal state treaties? I think this place, like this bitch ass colony, like it dulls our dreams and like it wears us down, like it wears us down and it makes us wait and wait and wait on their terms. So I think we've really, we can have an opportunity to think about what is the world that we want to live in and not within the imagine, not within a, the white imagination, like what's the world that we want to live in? What's a good life for us? Um, and how, yeah, how do we engineer that then? And yeah, but I just, I go back to that Dean Spade um, quote a lot. Like we get more when we demand more. So yeah, learning from Aunty Tanya Day's family, being relentless and uncompromising. Um, but we should push, like personally, yeah, and I'm, I love the work that Vals has been doing on this, like pushing for the abolition of prisons and police. We, why can't, yeah, let's, I can't see how our self-determination in those places can exist at the same time. Um, our next question, Tyson, I feel is meant for you, um, which is, uh, where the impacts of colonisation have meant that young people are not, to, are not connected to their country um, and obviously in the system, Rosie Care, how can they best be supported um, to access um, and engage with um, cults and country? I don't know. I guess, you know, you, I suppose you should always aim to have these kids back with their families. Um, and if you can't do that, then have them, you know, you do, the, I suppose they do their return to country trips. Um, you know, it's important. For, it's, hard, it's a hard one because it's, I know for me, like, I've got, I've got a close bond with a family member that was, um, that was a, a stolen Jed member and, um, you know, got to know their kids and, and grandkids because we found out about them sort of later in life. And it's, I've, I've been able to see the changes in their, their kids and grandkids when they've reconnected with country and they're a lot more um, confident in themselves and, and things like that. And, and they, they hold that story a lot stronger about where their mom's from, um, you know, what happens on their country, things like that. Um, so it's, you know, it's it's slowly just, you know, embedding these things that this these stories into these kids about their identity and their, their connection to the country. Um, I do it as much as I can for my own daughter. Um, she lives up here in Mackay, so I'm up here in Yui country or Yui, Yubira country, um, central Queensland. But, um, you know, she just started school on Monday, but I'm, you know, I'm constantly doing what I would be trying to be doing if she was back home, living on the country. Um, and, you know, it's taking her out of the bush, um, teaching her, you know, about certain places and, and stories. And um, it's all to do with place and story and, and country and things like that. Um, and for me, it was sort of embedded, you know, going out, you know, going healing, things like that. But it became really strong for me when I sort of learned, you know, family tree stuff. But I, I really learned the narrative of my ancestors. Um, through to today, through doing, you know, tours, cultural and stuff, other things, and it's more more sitting with elders and, and things like that out on, on country. So that's, I guess, what you should be aiming for. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, uh, I haven't worked with kids in Resi. Um, so these, these uh, uh, you know, Sissy and I, you can, might be able to share a bit more, but, um, you know, get them back on country and, and be as consistent as you can. It's really important, so. Yeah, I think that consistency, consistency um, thing is, you know, the most important thing. I've, you know, seen our ACROs organise these return to country trips and, like, like what I've seen is they're once every five years or so and it's, like, one that I've been a part of within the same, you know, I keep referring to a sibling group with white carers as well, but talk to the family about what they want with the cultural plans and the needs and the cultural, these, um, yeah, return to country things because um, I feel in some cases they're doing more harm than good in that it's become like this cultural experience for the white carers to come along and like that's just not, 
in my opinion, not what it's about. And it becomes like quite an overwhelming experience for the young person. I think like making, whilst like I don't support crew kids going with white carers, but obviously it's happening and making those placements culturally safe the kids shouldn't be there in the first place if they're not culturally safe. But those carers need to go on a journey of their own and not um, tack themselves on to the journey of that young person. Like they're completely two different experiences. Um, I think that needs to stop 100%. And I think like, yeah, the consistency thing, like once every five years isn't enough. Like there's like, you know, going back to country and then there's like this long period of, you know, yearning to go back and like being there. And I think like, yeah, just emphasizing on that consistency thing, but. Sissy, what you just um, talked about in terms of white foster families, um, there's actually a, a, a question in the, um, in the Q&A about that. And uh, Duncan has asked, what can white foster families who do get placements with Indigenous youth do to better connect these young people to their community and country. And um, I thought you had a, an accurate answer in saying don't tack yourself on to a child's journey and you have to go on your own, but um, what does that look like? Yeah, look, it's really hard because we're in a situation where the numbers of child removals are just, like, out of this world. And I, like, disagree so strongly with our kids going white carers but at the moment like you know you probably see it it's like kids are in hotels like living with you know um workers on rotation and it's it's this like annoying thing that we get into in like and now you might have a better way of explaining it than me but it's like like what is what is better than and I hate that like I hate that my mind even goes to that um and I dream that it doesn't one day, but yeah, I don't know. I just think that don't, don't become a carer in with the minds, with that saviour mindset. Like this child is a child of the, of our community, you know, not yours. And you're caring for that child um, temporarily, hopefully. And advocate for that child to be with their family and with their community and on their country and make that like like it may seem really harsh but make that the line in the sand in the placement like that this is this child belongs to our community like my community their community like and um have that as the foundation of of having an Aboriginal child in your care and I am part of this like group on Facebook that someone invited to me years and years ago and it's like a carers group in Melbourne it's and there's posts every day in it that are like oh I've got an Aboriginal kid like what can I do with my Aboriginal kid today and like people comment and say oh like I took mine to the museum today it's like it I've yeah so it's yeah, I don't know. It's and it's about like family members advocating for where you aren't able to take on that family member and like where you know that a family member of yours is in. Like, I know I'm going off track. I know that it was about white carers, but conscious like with in my mind where I haven't had capacity for to care for a child or um, in my family or community, it's uh, making sure that you you kind of allocate time to advocating for that child and ensuring that that child doesn't get lost in the system and lost in the daily lives of um, white foster carers. And I feel like I've been dissing white foster carers a lot throughout this panel, but I've had, you know, very mixed experiences um, with them. Uh, and I also think there are white foster carers who go into care with good intentions and um, those need to be worked upon through the 
roles and the ACOs who have the responsibility and the funding to do that, basically. If, while we're on this topic of children in care, um, they have a very small, small little narrow area where their voice can be heard. And even then, that voice is very, very constrained um, in the way that that space is made. Um, how could we actually give children a voice in the space um, of child? I don't like to call it welfare. Um, child child theft. <laughs> um, how do we create that space for them to actually have a voice that is listened to, um, that influences decision making? Because I think it's really important that um, when looking at voice, it's not just about being heard, it's about having influence and it's about that informing decisions. What age is it where a child in care gets a lawyer? What age Ten. is that again? 10. Yeah, look, um, no, you can go. I just, I feel like I've talked too much in this moment. No. Oh, I, th I mean, once again, like I'm an adult, I've been thinking a lot, like I've got twin toddlers, thinking about firstly, I guess how the world, the world in general is not built for children. Um, I think it, we live in a society that really hates and devalues children. They're meant to be seen and not heard. Um, and spaces are designed for adults and which is a very white thing, you know, to, to not be able to bring your kids everywhere or whatever. But I think yeah, I, I don't know, as a 32 slash 21 year old, um, I don't know if I'm in the best position, like to speak on the self-determination of children, because I think they are in, yeah, they're the ones who know um, what they need and want. And they do and can articulate that from a very young age, which I am now learning. Um, they, yes. Children, children know what they want sometimes it is actually not a good thing yes. um but how yeah how do we this is like I'm going off now but how do we as adults like not apply that sort of colonial paternal um logic to children is yeah that that's something I've been thinking a lot about and also when I was a kinship carer as well like how how am I making sure I'm not replicating these structures in the home, our home environment sort of thing. But yeah, listen to kids, create spaces where there's, so yeah, that let them be self-determined and like, let's not lock them up. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, and I think if, I mean, we're, we've talked about, you know, that we're moving reforms in terms of treaty, truce and, and voice, but um, I think it's really important that whilst we're, creating these new spaces that we don't forget the children should have a say. And I think that's been lost thus far. Um, I am excited though, to see some of the work that Corey Youth Council doing um, around um, how children can have a voice and what that looks like. Um, and I hope that once it's finalized and out there, that it's something that we can all prioritize and act on because um, at the moment they have no voice yet. They're extremely vulnerable. Um, um, their life determined by or I, mean, I think oh sorry I was just gonna say I don't think I yeah something else I've been thinking about is like around voicelessness I don't think necessarily that people don't have a voice I think it's that they're not being listened to um is yeah potentially something I also had another thought but I lost it sorry um Come back, I reckon. Oh, also, yeah, I also wanted to give a shout out. Um, yeah, obviously love the work that the Koori Youth Council have been doing, but also the um, National Indigenous Youth Education Coalition that um, Hayley Maguire started, which is about young people, design, young black fellows designing their education system. Yeah, I think they're doing really exciting work as well around like the self-determination of young black fellows. Yeah, agreed. And just like on that topic, topic of not being heard, like young people having a voice and not being heard, I think like it can be translated into the already built systems that are there and that um, need to be, you know, dismantled. And I think like 
a frustration where you're a family member, like a kinship carer, like my argument would be that we, where we have like a really strong and authentic relationship with the young people that we're caring for as um, kinship carers, I think that where there's the court proceedings that kinship carers, there should be some sort of process for kinship carers to go through to be added as a party to the proceedings because you'll often see, you know, yeah. court hearings playing out where our input is translated and filtered through the 50 million child protection workers that we've dealt with that child. And then, you know, when you see it in a court report, it's just completely like it, it doesn't reflect the like insight and the connection that we have with the kids that we've that we're caring for and I feel like there I don't know whether there's been stuff around that but it was often a frustration of mine of like you know being told that you know you're not a party so you don't get a say and um obviously where the child's um young like they you know and spaces are unsafe like court spaces like child protection spaces and these young ones are just trying to survive you know and like making sure that like there's a fear as well, like you don't know what's going on in a placement with that child. So where you're asking that child, like, do you want to live here or do you want to move? Like there's something deeper there to acknowledge, like in the response that you do get from that child and just acknowledging, you know, their thoughts, feelings and emotions and their survival mode and um, fight and flight that would be enacted, you know, within themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm. that plays a huge yeah huge role a big thank you to all of our panelists today particularly those um who joined last minute um and made an awesome contribution um and given us plenty to reflect on on lead up to invasion day um and thank you for everyone who's joined us in the audience it's encouraging to see so many people engaging with these topics a reminder um, to use bars and Lifeline if you needed. So Yarning Safe and Strong is on 1 800 959 Lifeline on 13 11 14. And please take the time over the next week to reflect on the things we've discussed today and how you can support and pressure governments to deliver an Aboriginal self determination to address the community legacy of invasion and colonisation. Thank you and goodbye.